Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me 320 Simpilot and today we're taking a look at the Leonardo MD82 for Microsoft Flight Simulator otherwise known as Fly the Mad Dog uh, it's a variant of the MD80 aircraft the McDonnell Douglas MD80 otherwise known as the DC9 so this has just been released from Microsoft Flight Simulator it is a high high detail add-on so we are expecting to see lots of systems working and lots of uh, good simulation practices going on with this aircraft. It retails quite expensive uh, on the sim market, although prices will obviously vary by country, but this is one of the more expensive Microsoft Flight Simulator add-ons out at the moment. This was previously released for P3D and some other simulators, so it's been around a while. So this, this company, Leonardo, knows about this aircraft very well, so it makes sense that they've brought it to Microsoft Flight Simulator. In today's video, I'm going to run through a flight. We're going to fly it from Milan down to Naples just to show you what it's like and uh, give you a bit of a sense of, of what this add-on is and some of my initial thoughts on it. Uh, I won't call this a full review because this is a, a very complicated add-on with lots and lots of systems that are going to take time to get to grips with, uh, which is something that you'd expect from a, a full, full fidelity simulation of one of these aircraft. I've got the Alitalia livery here, of course, one of the big operators of this airliner. The MD-80 series came out, or the MD-82 this is based on, is a variant of the MD-80 series. This is, came out in the 1980s and is, of course, uh, it, it's no longer in service these days for a lot of the world. It is still around, but it was not very fuel efficient by the time it was retired, it being replaced by the A320 and 737. It did initially compete with those. Um, so this is one of the older variants. They did eventually create a newer version of the MD-80 that used the IAE V2500 engines, which uh, those regular viewers of the channel will know very well from all of our Airbus streams. It is the A320's engine if they chose the IAE option. So they did eventually update it, but this older variant uses uh, a, a less efficient engine, and that would be part of the reason why it's no longer flying around today. So we're going to look at the externals, look at the interior, and fly it around. I'm a real-world Airbus pilot. Uh, but of course I've not flown the MD-80 in any shape or form in any simulator ever so this is purely going to be a, uh, a real airline pilot's perspective on this add-on and how it feels but obviously not an experienced pilot of this aircraft at all. Right let's get started in the video. Let's start off, of course, with the exterior model as we have it parked up here on stand. So this is how it loaded into the simulator with the cold and dark or just parked it up on a stand. There is an external application that runs whilst you are using this, this add-on uh, where you can adjust the panel states. It's quite a confusing uh, application, but it has lots of different features such as changing the states and also the config of the aircraft. So that sort of runs in parallel outside of the simulator, or it appears to anyway. So here we are, and I actually think it's a very nice external model. I've had no trouble with it. The, in fact, in some ways, I think it's very, very good. So we've clearly got the dimensions right and all the little aerodynamic details, such as uh, you've got this, um, I'd call it the strake. I don't know what it's actually called here with no step on it. And then you've got nice little details like here, like external power, receptacle, there you go. So that's all put on there. You've got the angle of attack um, indicator sitting drooping down. I'll be curious to see, once we get in the air, we'll see if that actually moves in line. As you look at the uh, nose gear backwards down the aircraft, you can see that they've really put a lot of work into getting the, the texturing right, and it does look pretty grimy. Um, I wouldn't want to get too close to some of the textures, uh, as proved here. <laughs> um, there are a few that are less desirable now this is a low nose aircraft so not such an issue but just a few textures that uh, are a little bit uh, dubious from close up nice at range like if you look at that wing i think that's one of the better looking wings at the distance that we've seen in microsoft flight simulator i think it looks very nice indeed but what you don't want to do is <laughs> take the drone like this it's a bit uh, cruel but here we go we've got to do it as uh, as we've got this add on here uh, and as you go right up to it you can see the textures start to to lose their their shine a little bit so that is something to be aware of with this um i don't mind because this is the sort of drone work that you're only going to do if you're making videos with this like me <laughs> uh, if we move away again it pretty quickly starts to look like the real deal and i i'm i'm pretty satisfied with that i don't i don't feel like the textures are a, a let down at all and in fact as i said the grime that they've modeled has really really definitely the right way to go for this aircraft i feel personally You've got uh, rear stairs for this aircraft, a nice little unique design feature which they have not missed out. And they have included a 3D internal cabin, so that is quite good. Now I am using the drone view, so hopefully we can just zoom up here. 
and head into the cabin and there you go now this is one of the liveries that was included uh or it's not included it's downloadable from leonardo so there are of course third party liveries now as well nice to see the green interior which uh, should be the yeah alitalia seats so little details like that have all been included which is all quite quite nice to enjoy quite happy with that three by two seating in this aircraft quite unusual but there we go uh, nice if you get the, the two seats on the left certainly not so lucky if you're in that middle seat on the right hand side and then there's the cockpit which we will look at again shortly so yeah definitely definitely a nice uh, visual model to look at uh, just don't get too close to to some parts of it which is strange because obviously there's other parts which look quite good even even up close but i mean look at this staircase really nice grimy practical just again don't put the camera right up uh, onto it as I said at the start, the shape of the aircraft has been captured perfectly. It really, really gives off that vibe. There's no mistaking this for anything else. And they've not missed, as far as I can see, any any obvious tricks with it. We've even got the you know, pitot-statics. All things that you'd expect are all modelled and in the right place. Now, if we jump into the flight deck, uh, we will look at the cockpit in more detail, obviously, as we go. But we do have an EFB, and on here is where we can control those stairs and things like that. So... What I'm going to do is turn it on. You have to hold the button. It took me a long time to figure that out. And that's a theme of this add-on. This is not the simplest add-on I've ever used to get going. Uh, they do provide the documentation. Some of the documentation is a little bit um, lacking. It, it, it assumes a bit more knowledge than I have. I've been searching through it and searching through it, and there's a lot of documents included. So it is not the simplest add-on to get started with. If you're expecting to be able to just jump in, load up a uh, flight plan into the the efb like you would an x-plane or something no it's not quite like that it's it is very powerful but it is not as slick to use as some others here we go we can open up uh, different doors so we can have the aft service door open up some cargo and why not forward service if we go to ground we can connect to the gpu out there um, you can see the fuel we're asking for you can even de-ice the aircraft uh, and you can connect let's connect to ground unit and you can also go to maintenance and open up a few things. So let's have a look at the engine cows while we're here. Um, so there we go. So we've messed around a bit. And look at that. Now that is a great feature. So I've always talked about how I like the models in these sims, especially with scenery and so on, to feel like you've got a sort of diorama. So uh, I like when you feel like you've got the, the, the full representation. So here we go, JT-8D. This is the engine that they use on this aircraft. Again, texturing don't get too close <laughs> but from a distance very nice and certainly more than they needed to include because there's not many add-ons that have engine cows opening up uh, too regularly so that's lovely and uh, i can't actually see so i don't think there's physical models of the the air site units maybe they're using the default microsoft stuff but there's some more doors open and things so that is uh, the exterior model when parked up on stand i think it's very nice let's jump into the airplane and have a look at a few more of the, uh, the cockpit setup we're going to start it up soon and get underway towards naples okay so on the flight deck you can see this one has a nice green interior texture there is also the other gray style i think it depends on the livery so i do like that because this is the uh, the texture you, or the color of the panels you had at alitalia i assume it was a variant of the aircraft as opposed to a specific livery um this is obviously quite a rare aircraft to see nowadays so uh, i'm going to apologize in advance for those of you watching who do know about this airplane because i am certain i'm going to get a lot of things wrong we're going to run through the startup now but the manuals included in this aircraft are very extensive and comprehensive and they cover a lot of things including the systems tests what i'm going to do today is just power it up uh, using my best sort of mix of systems uh, knowledge ba very basic systems knowledge from from generic airplanes and i'm going to power it up and get the engines up and running and we'll see how the aircraft handles and behaves we're not going to go deep 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 into each system because i just am not qualified to give you that information but the manuals that are included do tell you every systems check you want you might possibly want to be doing in this aircraft during the startup sequence including all sorts of details like egt changes on the apu all sorts so that is all available to you with this add-on hence it's a uh, you know a high detail aircraft but we won't be doing that in this video because it will take forever and it will involve a lot of me reading pdfs which i know i'm quite happy to do on streams i've done it before but <laughs> for this one we won't so we're going to go to the overhead panel and it has the keyboard shortcuts assigned as they recommended so there you go and we can see the external power is available to us but what i'm going to do is turn on the battery now the overhead panel on this aircraft is a real mission to understand i i cannot believe how far we've come in ergonomics design of aircraft and it, you've got to remember this aircraft competed with the a320 it was out around the same time which is hard to believe but yeah this is the the overhead panel you're presented with and i even find the 7371 a bit easier to understand that's because this aircraft 
didn't use systems designs from other aircraft it seems very or i imagine it did from some airplanes that we're not familiar with but probably older aircraft so it's very different so master battery on which is somehow in this little apu panel <laughs> uh, but there you go that's the master battery on we have a nice sort of caution warning panel here which starts cycling through uh, and I will have the sounds on for you as we go through eventually. And then it's the usual things, wiper selectors off, landing a lever down, aux hide pump off. The hydraulics on this aircraft, quite limited in their use. They are used for flaps, brakes, gear, but they're not used for flight controls, interestingly. But the aux pump is in the middle position off there. And if you're wondering why the hydraulic panel is down here, so am I. This is the story of this aircraft and you're going to see a lot of this where i am struggling to find some <laughs> some basic systems it's taking me ages uh, we need the flap slat lever to be up and retracted so that is over here and that is in the full forward position it's of note that this flap lever has an up retracted and then a zero position if you move it from up to zero the slats extend and then you move the flaps as you go past that so you, there you go you've got a takeoff section and a landing section as well Lots and lots and lots of controls on this center panel. Look at that trim handle. Isn't that interesting? Very different. We've also got a uh, trim indicator, I believe. And if we come over here, we have the fuel masters. Then we've got, uh, I, what's that? That's the out long trim. I, I don't know. Uh, this is to do with the cabin pressurization, this system here. So this would be for manual pressurization. I understand it. I don't fully understand it, but that's what I think. And just to make it completely confusing, here's the pneumat pneumatic cross fleet valves. So they're closed down there and they go open to forward. That is just, it has taken me ages to, to figure out it's some of the most basics. It got to the point when I first sat down with this checklist where I had to Google every switch uh, and you might find the same. Anyway, speed brake lever is traditional. There it is. Uh, let's retract and disarmed. If it was up, it would be armed, but luckily it won't arm on its own. Circuit breakers check, APU start. So let's fire up that APU on the overhead panel. Oh, excuse me. Uh, so that is on this panel. As we said, we need to turn on the start pump or it won't get enough fuel. Then we're going to put the master switch to start. I'm going to hold it there and then we should see the APU gauges which are just above it up here start to spin there it goes that will spin and uh, this is just an n1 percentage expecting it to reach 100 percent because that's quite normal for apus they run at 100 percent is where they're designed to be um, and then i we should see the egt rise as the field is introduced Now, there are other checks we should have done, including battery checks and so on, but uh, we aren't going to do that <laughs> right now. There it goes, lighting up properly. Right, so let's establish some electrical power then from the APU. If we were to move up here, I can actually see the... Uh, this is our little electronic monitor, as it were. So I can see the APU there sitting 115 volts, 400 hertz, which you'll all be familiar with now. Very standard um, voltage and frequency. And then we can clunk over. And that provides a lot of the external or a lot of the electrical power to the aircraft. The external power was on here, so I, you, I could have used that. Uh, hence that blue light is on. Um, otherwise, it would be off if that was not available. So there we go. We've now got electrical power. We can also turn on the APU air. So I'm going to turn that on which might see the EGT fluctuate. There's the EGT rising. So this is just to show you the system's depth on this aircraft. That rises up uh, and then it should stabilize back down a bit uh, shortly after because we are not using any, any pneumatic power. But what we could do is start providing some air conditioning. And this is another thing I've been deeply, deeply struggling with <laughs> to try and establish. So we've turned on the APU air uh, and then we're not supplying anything else. So if I open the pneumatic cross feed valves and then put the cabin pressure control lever auto and the outflow valve in the decrease position i think we can put the air conditioning supplies to auto <laughs> yes it is this is probably the most confusing part so we we would open up the cross feed presumably that's to let air get from the apu into the right part of the pneumatic system then i'm going to come onto the overhead panel to the air conditioning panel and i'm going to put these to auto uh, which is the full down position and now you can see there is uh, some pressure in the system so i'm hoping that means we're getting some cabin temperature control but i could be wrong with this this is something i'm going to have to learn as time goes on this by the way is the cabin pressurization so there is a decrease position and we want it in the auto up position uh, and then you have the close increase decrease thing there um, and the valve is open which i think is what we want yes the valve itself is 
shown here as valve open. It is incredible, an incredible <laughs> piece of design. I don't know how they came up with it, but that's what we have. Good. Moving on then, so I think we're establishing some sort of air. Uh, we would check things like the emergency lights, the passenger address, uh, station lighting, loads and loads of things on the overhead panel. Um, we would set the trims to zero, which they already are, and someone would do the walk around. We're going to check the parking brake is set. That's over here. So down is disengaged, and I want it set. So I'm going to pull the parking brake. We're going to have the landing lights, which is off and retracted. Those are in front of us up here and in front of us up here. Um, let me just make sure. The emergency lights they should be an arm there we go so i was i skipped over that a little bit <laughs> uh yeah so lights for some reason are put right in front of us uh, and then we can turn on the flight directors and what we want to see here each side is our fma so flight mode enunciators they're what you're used to seeing on pfd at the top on the airbus or on the 737 they're written here this is quite common on aircraft not using the full electronic displays, the full EFIS setup. Uh, so more modern aircraft will have this integrated. Older aircraft like this, this was quite common. The 146 we've also seen released recently has a similar setup. So there we go, we have heading hold and out hold shown in that window. Moving on then, there's plenty of tests we could also do for the autopilot system, the auto land system that you're supposed to do on the first flight of the day. As I said, we're not going to do that today, but we will check that the static is in norm. So this is the static air. Now, what does that mean? Static air means still air. It's the ambient pressure around the aircraft. So if there was a blockage on the sensors outside the aircraft, let's see if we can find them. Uh, if those were blocked, then we could have trouble telling our altitude because it's obviously the static air pressure, the ambient air pressure around the aircraft that we use to judge the altitude of the aircraft. So let's see if I can spot it through here. I think this would be it. This would be on the airbus. There you go, static port. Do not plug or deform holes. So these holes just, just lead into the instrumentation and the air data computers usually. Uh, actually, they've got all of them in one place. Captain, cabin, auxiliary and first officer. Airbus has them separated. There have been major, major crashes where those have been blocked up with tape before and it's not been spotted so very very important but anyway that you'd have an alternate source in case that source was blocked or your your main source was blocked as we carry on we would check the trim so you've got uh, alternate and primary trim so you've got trim switches here on the yoke you've also got this which i'm guessing is the alternate trim handle so as i move that you can see that the trimmer moves but it's just a handle to push forward or pull backwards it's not a rotating wheel like we have on the 320 or on the 737 um, but that is the the backup system and then you've also got your, your trim switches here so i have my trimmer assigned to my joystick and it runs the trimmer as you would expect if we go back onto the uh, or oh, while I'm here as well, I will check the rudder trim should be at zero. And uh, I'm hoping that's the one of these is the aileron and one of these is the rudder. <laughs> yeah, it is It is quite something. If we go back onto the overhead panel now, we would set up the flight data recorder. You can put it into a ground test, set up an event, set up the day and date and so on up there. Uh, if we move up from the overhead panel, uh, sorry, if we move up on stage we get the upper overhead panel here's more of the systems related things like the oxygen pressure uh, ground service stuff so things that mechanics might want to use i believe and then we've got the cargo fire test for example which we can do we've got the loops which loops are selected so we want both of course a loop is talking about a um it's a uh, it's like a wire or a cable or a tube or a tube more i should say that goes around the engine of the main engines and you can see there's one on the apu as well and the idea is if that loop is heated up enough by what presumably is a fire, it will set off this alarm. So we have two loops on each engine in case one fails, of course, and obviously the same on the APU, which could also catch fire. So that's what these loops are talking about, and you can test those up there. I've turned on the panel lights for the overhead panel as well, and I'll try and find some more lights as we go through. <laughs> lights, which is always the absolute hardest thing to find in any new airplane. As we move down back to our uh, more traditional overhead panel, we can make sure that the instruments are set to the norm position up here, FMS norm and so on not going to fit around with that too much you can test things like the winter warning uh, a lot of interesting verbal warnings on this aircraft so in the airbus there's uh there's one there you know it will say wind shear wind shear but this one will tell you positive shear or tailwind shear and all sorts of other call outs it's quite interesting and they've got lots of warnings as well take off config it will tell you flaps or whatever it, it's very specific so that is a way of replacing or instead of having the electronic system we have on the more modern aircraft which will actually write it out on the screen in front of you this aircraft has lots of verbal oral warnings that it will say to you as you go through so that's always quite interesting i quite like aircraft that do that it's the sort of aircraft that instead of clicking at you will say overspeed 
over speed very calmly <laughs> i'm not sure if this one does say that i think it was an Embraer thing but there we go now there's plenty more tests we can do while we're here uh, fuel tests you're supposed to run where you would run a pump and check that certain warnings disappear and turn it off again and check that they come back again i'm not going to go through all of that we need to turn on the right aft pump so the let me check the right if the apu is operating leave the right aft fuel tank pump on right aft fuel pump on that's providing fuel to the APU. I can turn off the start pump now. That was just used to start it up. But there we go. So that is a good place to be. Uh, we can have the cabin sign. So I'm going to put the no smoking to on. Uh, we're going to have the seatbelts uh, off at the moment because I need to refuel the aircraft. Then you can do a pitot-static test and so on. Now, what is the test? Well, this confused me for a long time. The pitot heats are off at the moment. If you switch this to any position, they all come on automatically. But what you're doing is you're displaying this the the meter the current on this dial to prove it's working so i can scroll through them and check that they're all drawing current and you'll see there's different current for each one it's quite interesting so these are all the electronically heated surfaces so static ports pitot ports and so on we're going to leave it off for now because we're on stand but there we go um it took me ages to find that and look at this i like the system you can click on it and it will show you the different systems and any warnings that are there um i quite like that don't know how to bring it all back though <laughs> I need a, a big reset button, but there we go. Oh, it comes back automatically. We are going to turn on the windshield anti-ice now because apparently in cold conditions, the manual says it can take up to 30 minutes. So that's on, but we'll leave the anti-fog system off for now. We don't need that. And uh, we've got here, you can see the engine uh, anti-ice and the airfoil, the wing anti-ice system as well. So a lot of different uh, areas all shown with these sort of very unremarkable switches, but in at least a practical place for us to reach them if we need them. Um, we can carry on, of course. There's the anti-skid system uh, up here, which we can test an arm. Your damper is on. Uh, where was the anti-skid? I've lost it now. There we go. That's in the arm position. And you can stall test, of course. Stall. And it says stall, stall. But so does the Airbus, to be fair. The Airbus does have the stall. I <laughs> call out. Good. As we move through, uh, we've got two uh, more tests that I'm going to skip past. We can sort out the lights. Just an example of the design of this aircraft. Here's the logo light, which lights up the tail. That goes on there. Of course, nowhere near any of the other light switches, which are all here on the on the glare shield. Um, so that, uh, that's quite, quite telling. <laughs> so as we move through then, it's time to look at what we want to do um, on the glare shield. We can set the lights as we want. So I'm going to want the navigation lights on typically. Uh, so I found them is this pause strobe. You set it to pause. Uh, both would obviously include the strobe lights. So there we go. So we have some external lights on the aircraft now. Moving into the center panel. Again, lots more systems checks you can do. You can click here to get rid of the yoke. Uh, and I'm going to uh, pull this to align or level the artificial horizon, the standby artificial horizon here. So there it goes. Uh, we can also reset the fuel flow. It is at zero anyway, but there's a little reset button that you can press there to get it back to zero. You can do the same. We can test the fuel quantity gauges, certain numbers it should show. I'm not, again, entirely familiar with what they are. Also, the hydraulic system, we can uh, power it up. So if I put the AUX pump to on, uh, it provides hydraulic pressure. It took me ages to find this. We've got the hydraulic pressure here, moving the flaps up. So that you'll notice, um, <laughs> I should have shown you properly, outside the flaps were slightly down and you saw them just move up there. That's because they will eventually droop with gravity. So apparently the hydraulics will retract them back up to zero where we want them. So that's a nice detail. Uh, there we go. It's because I've been recording this video for a while. Hydraulic pressure is at uh, 2,900 PSI on this side, zero on the other, and we've got quantity in the system. So that took me ages and ages to find. We put the trans pump on, and it will therefore be able to pump power the other system using that also aux pump. So there we go. Now that's all powered up as well. So all simulated. I'm going to put those back to off and off. We do not need them right now. Brake temperature gauge down here. Again, more testing you can do. Uh, and we've got the fire bell test up here. I don't fully understand the testing process for this. I'm not going to fiddle with it too much. So what I want to do now is set the Q&H and get the aircraft ready for our flight with the more traditional things that you'd expect to see. So we're now in a, a relatively powered up airplane. I'm sure I've missed plenty of things in that process. We will run the checklist before we go, but let's load in the flight plan and the fuel and the weights. Now you are very welcome, of course, to just use your SimBrief 
PDF file or use a web browser and use that to load up the airplane. You could ignore that EFB and you could simply load it into the FMS, which is down here, which works very well. You've got a little EFIS screen, so we have a normal RNAV style line that you'll be used to seeing from other aircraft. So you can absolutely do that and you can load in the weights yourself. But I've set it up using that tool to load in the weights from my flight plan. So I've taken a flight plan from Simbrief. It is not as simple as I'd hoped, but you have to take two different um, files from Simbrief. You download them in the format for the Leonardo MD-80 and you have to put them into a specific folder. Again, that's described in the documentation, so I won't go into it now. But here we go. So we're starting from Milan and then we're flying to Naples. So I'm going to type that in and hopefully it will find the weights I want. So there's my flight. I put it in as IMX222. That's just the, my standard sort of test flight number. Of course, we would be an Alitalia flight here. Uh, so there we go. Here's our passengers and our cargo, and that is all loaded in. So that is done. Then we can go back, and I can go to... Uh, about Where's the fuel? That says we've got fuel on board of 8.2. So I'm just going to check that that was what I was expecting to have from my Simbri flight plan. Um, Simbrief said we need a total fuel of 8226 so that has worked so that is good and I'm going to check on the fuel page there we go 8.2 so we have exactly the right amount of fuel for this flight it gives us a gross weight of 59.3 tons um, good okay so that's reassuring that that's worked and I can see different weights up here zero fuel weight and so on so that's good news then we can uh, go to our performance we can put in Lima India Mike Charlie uh, and then we have our different runways and so on to calculate the speeds but there is an alternative way. If you prefer, you can actually go into the FMS index services. And in here, we can disconnect the GPU. We don't need that anymore. So just like on the iPad, disconnect the air conditioning. We don't need that anymore. We can do the boarding because, of course, we don't have those on yet. Uh, and you can actually de-ice the aircraft. So if there was ice, you can press ground the ice start. And it will tell you at the moment it should just say 0% ice because it's already done. So the icing is removed uh, and then here's the doors we can close and retract all through the fms i do like this i think it's I, I like the green screen style fms it's pretty pretty old school pretty cool good right let us go to the init page then and start loading up our flight so starting from milan lima india mike charlie and oh yes of course what i should also show you is if we go to menu a cars pre flights init data I'm going to init request and I'm going to hope, keep, my, keep your fingers crossed that this works, that it will download starting at my Charlie to Naples. It's downloaded that. Again, this is all from putting those two files into the Mad Dog folder in my uh, documents and then it can download it. it. Took me a while to work that out, but there it is. So I'm hoping now if we go to init ref, it has some idea about that. Uh, weight and balance should. Uh, well, we're not going to worry about that because we've already done it. Um, uh, flight plan? I don't know. Let's find out. So if we go to return, menu, back to IFMC, and we can be aligned on the, I'll just align it on the GPS position, which is very, very close uh, to, so about where we'd expect to be for our stand. And then we can put in the route. No, it hasn't loaded in the route, so no trouble. So just, this is very Boeing, very easy to understand for those of you used to the 737, starting at Milan, going to Naples. And then we're going to just check the runway in use. So what I'm going to do is depart from runway 35 left. And then we're going to take off, make a left turn around on the Farrak departure. I'll use the Farrak 6 Bravo, head out and around. This will hopefully prove to you that this airplane is quite capable of modern sort of departures. And it'll be very simple to use it on VATSIM, I believe. So... I oh, can hear the PAs running in the background. So let's just make sure I have the right runway. So that is 35 left. So I'm going to put that in 35 left. Uh, and if we go to departures arrival, departures, again, you'll recognize all of this from 35 left. Uh, we agreed. Ah, I think it's slightly out of date. It must be one database behind because it seems to change to the six. Uh, let me check six. Bravo. So I'm going to imagine that that was the uh, five Bravo. So this does come with a database, um, which is very nice. But then, of course, it won't be up to date unless you update it yourself. So I need to do that. That's my fault. Good. That is done. Don't seem to need to execute it. So I'm going to go to root uh, and then activate, execute, next page. So after. I was hoping to see Farrak there. Has that not worked? 
that's active. So root. Um, ah, here we go. So far to Farak from Farak. I'm going to go to log D, just to direct. This is all as you'd expect. So you type that in the right side for direct. Then if I go to the next page from log D, we're going to take Yankee six six three. You can hear the first officer helping out. I wish uh, she'd studied the MD80 a bit more to help us out on this flight. And then we're going to go to Ekdir. Those of you who've watched my channel a lot will recognize a lot of these points. This is a fairly familiar part of the world. We stream around here a lot. Um, then we've got Mike872, which we're going, yes, hello. Then we're going to take that to Lomed. She's obviously feeling uh, her input is not being appreciated. Um, to Lomed, Zulu910. To Ipcam. Which will lead us to our arrival. So I'm going to execute that. Departure arrival. Index. Naples arrival. I'm expecting the Ipcam to Zulu. See if I can find it. I'm going to do the RS for runway at 24. Ipcam to Zulu. That is in and executed. And now, if we look at our nav display, there we go. There's that departure out and around Farrakh, and then off we go along our route. So pretty straightforward, and as you would hope for a, for a modern aircraft. Let's also, of course, not forget to do the init ref bits. So cruising altitude for this flight uh, is going to be at 29,000 feet. It's not a very long flight. Uh, the fuel, we're going to have a total fuel of 8.2 on takeoff. Now, I don't fully really understand what the schedule means. It asks for, I don't know, I've gone for manual. Uh, zero fuel weights. I'm going to take this from the EFB. Uh, let's run back to our weight and balance. So zero fuel weight, 51.1 tons. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you aboard. Federal regulations require that carry-on items are still part of the... Good. Total reserve fuel. Well, that's going to be... Uh, I'm going to add that myself. I need alternate of 2.2 .2 for Fuimachino. Final reserve of 1.3. So that is 3.4, roughly. Which will be plenty. 3.4 tons of reserve fuel. Cruising wind is going to be uh, an average of 289 at 22. Uh, ISA deviation. I think we're running at ISA today, so I'm going to just put it in zero because uh, that's just what I use in the simulator uh, for often for these videos to help me out with the ease of calculations. Then we go to takeoff, and in here we can load the speeds. Now, I don't think there's any automatic things like that, but uh, we are at 59.3 for takeoff. What I'm going to do now, of course, is go to our calculator. So takeoff calculator is over here, and we go back, performance, you've got takeoff and landing tabs, we're going to go to takeoff, we're taking off from 3.5 left, dry runway, calm winds, QNH 1013, 15 degrees, this is the standard atmosphere, hence I use it, <laughs> takeoff weight, we agreed, and I've already forgotten, oh, don't want to do that, uh, 59.3, by the way, the windows do open, that is visible on the outside model, which is pretty cool. Something I'm sure an Alitalia MD80 would have to do a lot out in the summer heat. There you go. I like that. Anyway, we'll close that back up. Got to be careful. There's a lot of scroll wheel use in this add-on. So scrolling the wheel over things can often do that. 59,300. Okay. Calculate, please. Flaps to three. Maximum limit to eight, 73.6. So we're well below that. Uh, we're going to go 142, 147, 156. 142, 147, 156. Uh, with a takeoff, I'm not entirely sure what the takeoff EPR number would need to be. We've got a cell temp of 50. Now, I don't think those aspects of this are used. If we look on the forward instruments, we have a little computer here. So if I press this to it's not in any mode if i press it into takeoff mode it gives the epr limit of 1.95 and i have not yet worked out how to adjust this maybe with takeoff flex there we go um flex temperature of this says 50. so i'm guessing here now i'm gonna put 50 in that window okay so found it for the flex temperature what we have to do is there's an art switch here this must be switched to off so if you're taking off with full power you can just press take off uh, 
power on here, but we're not. So I need to turn off the art switch, press take off flex, and you can see 50 over there. And if I change that temperature, it should, and you can see it there, adjust the EPR limit. But we're going with a temperature of 50 because there's an EPR of 1.82. So a lower thrust setting than we had uh, with the max thrust. So that's good. So that has worked and we are now getting close to being able to go. So let's just finish up with the normal automatic setup. Um, I don't know, but I can see a flight level 90 at Farrick. So I'm going to put that into the altitude window. Now, my understanding is you also need to, it's got out hold mode arm. You can pull it, but I don't know if that's making any difference at this point. But I think that puts it into the armed mode in amber here. So that's armed the altitude of 90. So there we go. Flight directors are on. I'm going to put the heading on to 350 as our initial heading off the runway. You'll see here we have the bank selector, so you can adjust how much bank. So I'm going to leave it at 30 for takeoff. I'm not sure if that's entirely right. And the speeds, I'm going to put V2 of 156 into the speed window. Again, I'm not sure if I need to do that, but that's something I want to do. We're also going to set the bugs ourselves because, of course, it won't draw them on like in the Airbus. We need to come down here and you can just click next to them and they should set. So there we go. So that gives us our V1 of 142, rotate of 147. So 142, rotate is not showing, so maybe you have to memorize that one. <laughs> Uh, but there we go, and we got our V2 bugged. So that's the green bug there. Good. Right. Well, I think I'm getting there, and it's getting to the point where I need to run the checklist and start up the the aircraft. I um, know it's been a long time to get to this stage, but this is a you know a complex add-on. I didn't want to rush through it, so let us move on to we finalise the MCDU. Um, we're going to set up the airplane to start up the engine. So let's make sure that the parking brake is on. So that's pulled up. So that is engaged. We need the APU air switch to go to the uh, on position because we're going to use the APU air to start the engine. We're then going to put the norm econ switch to normal. So this is overhead panel stuff. So there's a norm econ switch. You might have put that to econ if there was not many passengers and the airplane was managing to keep the temperature well. Uh, then we're going to have the fuel systems. We're going to move the pump switches to on on the left and right tanks, but we're not going to bother with the center ones. We're not using them. Then we're going to put the anti-collision lights to on. So that is going to be over here. That comes on, which will be the beacon. Oh, excuse me. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Then we can put the pneumatic cross feeds to open, which are these two down here. It took me ages to find. They are open because we need the air to move around the airplane. Thrust levers are both at idle. Those are up here, of course, back at idle. Engine ignition. So let's choose the system. So I'm going to use system A for this engine start. And here we go, we'll run the checklist and then we're going to start up the engines. So let me point out with the checklists, they do not include everything. These are very much abbreviated. This is the sort of checklist you would get on an airliner, which just assumes lots of things have been done. So um, we can go through them. We've done the flight recorder. I haven't quite. AHAR's alignment verified. FMGS position, FMS position check. Furniture lights armed, cabin signs. Uh, let's make sure I need to turn on the fuel signs as well. Uh, windshield anti-ice is on, you see. So it, it's it's just a design to check things that we have done or should have done. So things we've tested. I think you'd have a good chance at getting the airplane started up by following that. But before start checklist, parking brake is set. Pneumatic pressure, that is visible. Um, hmm, that's not good enough. Uh, we needed why is it only down at 20 let's turn off the supply i think that is taking up air pressure there we go now we have the pressure we want for the engine to start so pneumatic pressure is good enough engine selectors to a left and right tanks are on anti-collision lights on apu norms which is to norm uh, which was over here air conditioning supply switches to go off there you go so if i've done that already pneumatic cross feed levers are both open thrust levers are at idle next is the after start checklist so you can see that's quite abbreviated over what we've actually done so to start the engines here we need to quite quite standard we're going to um, run the engine starter which are these guarded switches here we hold it at the start position and we should see n2 spin which is going to be down here of course uh, n2 when n2 uh, accelerates to the right speed and let me check what that's going to have to be it's always something different should get to maximum motoring of 20 percent so we can hold it down this should get to 20 percent we should see n1 spin a little bit and then we're going to introduce fuel now i have not found i've tried i've not yet found the fuel the fuel master assignment these are the fuel levers 
just like many aircraft have them in that place. So I find this quite tricky to do and it's going to go slightly wrong. So let's start engine number two. I'm going to hold that there. You should hear some sound effects. I'm still holding it down and down here you can actually see N2 increasing. N1 is now spinning. It's going to start motoring at 20. Oh, sorry, maximum motoring is at least 20. Now, in theory, you should hold the switch and introduce fuel. I'm not able to do that because I haven't found the assignment and I'm going to have to let go. So I'm going to do that and turn it on quickly. You can see it starts to decelerate, but I'm hoping I introduce fuel quick enough for it to actually start up. Um, I might have to cheat. No. So this is the problem I'm having without being able to yeah, go fuel flow is also decreasing back down. So what I'm going to do is leave the fuel flow on. This is not how you should start it. I'm going to turn it on like that. And as, as you can see, the fuel flow is actually already on the very bottom of that, that gauge. Fuel flow is increasing already. So this is a, a very much incorrect way of starting the engine. But you, hopefully you can sympathize why I've had to do that. <laughs> so I'm just holding down that motoring start switch now. Finally, there we go, EGT light up, and that is uh, working. Now, the manual does include a whole description of what you should do if you do the wrong thing like I've done here. So you can simulate the failures and so on. It's it's very good, but that uh, is just all I can do with it at the moment. Something to point out at this stage, do not have your, if you're using the Thrustmaster TCA, do not have your Airbus engine master switches assigned uh, to the same keys. That was ruining my startup attempts. <laughs> so that's something to be aware of. So I need to, to keep trying with this in the future. So that's engine two started. Let's start up engine number one. Same idea. We're going to open the valve. N2, you can see, is already above. And I've actually already turned on the fuel master switch. And I'm hoping in a moment we will see some sort of light up from that engine. That's two good engine starts. Let's get ourselves pushed back and underway. Some nice sound effects on the exterior of the aircraft. These are quite unique sounding engines, so I do like to hear them. Very quiet on the flight deck because, of course, they're so far back, you really don't hear them much at all, which I imagine is realistic to the, the actual aircraft. Probably quite noisy for passengers in these rear rows. So we're going to release the parking brake and we are going to reverse with the tug. Let's run through the after start flow as best I can. So no surprise, start valves off ignition system can go off uh, and then what we're also going to do is turn on the pitot heater so you can set it to any of these positions as i said and uh, let me think if i can remember what else there is to do i'm probably going to want to set the flaps so our flaps for takeoff did this tell us flaps three it says now i don't know what three means um but <laughs> i'm going to assume it means somewhere about there uh or is it flap here th to three I, I really don't this is yeah it is Beyond my knowledge, I'm afraid, uh, there's a lot of <laughs> different controls and indicators. If we look down on the display, I've got it set to about 11, um, which hopefully is what we expect. <laughs> I'm constantly learning with this. So firstly, there's a second static air. There's one on each side, so you make sure that's set to norm. Thirdly, flap three, I can actually change on here. So I've set that to three. Um, on this little dial which seems to adjust the trim likewise the CG would adjust it as well so we've gone for flaps to three right hopefully that's enough of a pushback so we'll stop there we will set the parking brake and we'll say goodbye to the tug let us also run the after start checklist so engine ignition selector is off Peter static heaters on we're not using anti-ice air conditioning supply switches over here you can go to auto door cue light checked off now i think that's this uh but i'm not 100 percent sure <laughs> door here we go external power access door is still open mm, i'm gonna hope that disappears there we go so a bit of a glitch with my pushback helper there but anyway the door lights are now all closed all door closed which it tells us up there which is great news um, i'm gonna just adjust my efis to be a bit more reasonable so i'm gonna wind the range in a bit which i can do up here i like having the control here by the way you can put airports on nearby and change the mode um, and you can also click on the screen to cycle through them which is quite a neat idea and if you right click it goes back the other way so i'm gonna go to that page now which is the most traditional that i'm used to so we've set the flaps we've set the engines we've got the well we're going to use nav mode so i'm not too worried about which vr vor i have set 
Uh, we just need to configure the hydraulic system now as well. So we're going to turn on that aux pump and the trans, which is going to enable us to have the most redundancy if there's any failures of the hydraulic system. So that is all done. Finally, let's move on to taxiing. So <laughs> let's uh, go up to the overhead panel. I'm going to do this now because it's just me here. We're going to turn off the APU um, air switch. We no longer need it. We've started up the engines. So that is off. Uh, the TRP we've done down on the lower panel and we set the bugs. We've checked all the guidance and let's have a look at our flight controls. So uh, you can see the yoke. I oh, no, can't see any of the yokes. Uh, yeah, next point about this. Very similar to the BAE 146. This is a flight control system that works on trim tabs, not hydraulics. So as I move the yoke, you can see the trim tab moves up here on the elevator, but the control does not move. Um, it's not perfectly modeled. It's better modeled in X-Plane, I think, than Microsoft Flight Simulator. But there we go. As I move the trim tab, so that is nose down, which would effectively fly that control into the nose down position. Likewise, if I pull up, that will move down and can fly the elevator up. But it only works if there's air flowing over it, which they have modeled. Same for the aileron. If we look here on the actual aileron, the trim tab moves. When I try and roll, so if I roll full left, that moves in the opposite direction because it's going to fly that control up. Uh, but you can see the hydraulic roll spoilers do actually come up and deploy straight away. Anyway, so that's flight controls checked. The flaps are set where we want them. Not sure what we have a master warning for. Art in op. Yeah, well, we turned it off. That's good. So flight controls we've done. Auto brake, auto spoiler. So we can arm the auto spoiler. And the auto brake system is down here. Now I'm going to set this to take off and arm it take a briefing performed cabin report obtained there we go next is before takeoff so we know which runway we're going full length takeoff data is confirmed fuel balance is all good we've got four times on each side brake temperatures checked engine ignition we're going to set it to both so that's a sort of continuous ignition mode not sure what eoap means <laughs> so that is next after takeoff so let's get out there and finally get this airplane in the air The aircraft is quite benign on the taxi. Um, it does accelerate quite well, even uh, uh, with you know with passengers and fuel on board. So it can run away a little bit if you spool up the engines too much. I've got the steering assigned. I've, I'm not using the the nose wheel tiller. I don't use that on many add-ons at the moment. So I'm just using the rudder pedals, which works perfectly fine. Um, and yeah, a bit of bit of oomph needed to get around some of the, the tighter turns. We're going to head out now to the runway for our takeoff. A detail I do enjoy is if you give it a big boost uh, of thrust, you do get the smoke out the back of the engines. Quite typical on these older style engines, so I'll give it a rev up there. There you go, look at that. <laughs> That's a nice effect, it really captures the colour of it. So we'll see that again once we get into the air. But yeah, as you do the high power stuff, that's what you get. <laughs> now we could get a bit in trouble. Right, we're going to take off from this intersection. We've already done all of the checks that we need to do. Let's get the last of the the lights on. We'll get those onto bright. We'll get the uh, last of the uh, strobes on there. Good. And now we're going to line up and take off. Finally. Now before we get going, I want to talk about something that is incredibly <laughs> um, f fiddly to get right, which is the takeoff config warning. If you have anything slightly out of place, when you run the throttles up, you'll get the warning. So let me put the trim. Uh, well, let me put the trim to where I thought it should go, which is 14.4, which is what my takeoff weight CG should be. So I put this 14, and you can hear it saying stabilizer. Likewise, if I and my flap setting earlier, I put it to 3. That's wrong. It goes to whatever flap you're using. So flaps to 11. And then I put 11 here. I can see 11 up here. And now I know it's working. So that, if I didn't have that set to 11, it was just saying flaps. So it needs to know the flap setting you're using, which makes sense. I don't know where the 3 was coming from that we saw earlier. Um, and also the CG. Now, I can only assume I have the wrong trim set somewhere uh, in here. But I have yet to find it um so 
yeah, this must again be frustrating for those of you watching who know better. But for some reason, I haven't found a way, I haven't managed to get the trim to work. So what I've had to do is just put in a slightly more aft trim CG back a bit and then that clears the warning and it'll actually allow me to take off. So there we go. You can of course take off ignoring the warning but that's probably not recommended. There presumably is a reason it's set like that. <laughs> okay, so take off, let's try again. Throttle up. Should still have enough fuel <laughs> seeing as we had so much alternate fuel. Uh, brakes released and now we go to 1.82 on the EPR. bit more there's thrust set quite slow to accelerate not the most powerful aircraft in the world quick view outside see the smoke coming out the back very slow to get to 80 knots <laughs> let's hope we have enough runway to do this Very confusing. We have an airspeed indicator. This is not an airspeed. This is the Mach number. Airbuses don't show you that unless it's high enough. But in this, it's displayed all the time and quite distracting. I do like the way it bounces up and down. It's like the uh, the old rotor dials. There's V1, which would make sense because we're probably running out of room to reject. Let's rotate. Cool out as well from the FO. Up we go. Gear up. A little bit of turbulence now. I like the call outs coming from the FO. Very good. And 1200 feet. We're making our left turn. Now we're in heading hold mode. That's no good at all. I'm going to ask for nav mode. The Airbus would engage it about now. And we're flying to that M622. I'm not sure if the nav mode is going to engage or not. But there we go. We'll try it out. <laughs> Accelerating now. Claps are only at 11, so not too far to go with them. Bring this thrust back. We can set a limit now of climb thrusts. Nav mode has engaged. So I'm going to engage the autopilot. Oh, probably not like that. Anyway, after a bit of arguing with the automatics, we're bringing those flaps up. Remember, not zero, you go all the way forward, or the slats don't come in. So the flaps are in, the slats are in. We're doing 240 knots, which is okay. We're in nav mode. Let's remove the yoke so you can see. We're heading to knee lab, and then we're going to go left. I'm hoping this is going to work. So I've got nav mode here, vertical speed mode, 2,000 feet per minute, which it is doing. We're climbing up to 9-0, so let's just go straight up. We're going to set our altitude for the cruise, we said 29,000 feet. I'm going to put that in. I'm going to pull to arm it. And it goes into amber with armed. I'm going to set 1.8 as the climb thrusts. I'm going to try and hold an IS of where we are. So let's see if I can convince it to do that. So press IS. There we go. IS. If I go to 1.81, I'm hoping it will carry on the climb as it is. We shall see. <laughs> oh, warning there. What's that warning for? Not sure. Oh, yes, by the way, APU should be off by now. I totally forgot to do that. All we have to do is take the APU master switch and I can just set it to off. And there you go. Away it goes. Good, it's climbing 2,500 feet per minute, 230 odd knots. Keep the EPRs at 1.83. And now what I might do is engage the auto throttle and set the EPR limits. So hopefully it will now target 1.83 EPR because that's what the limit I put in is. EPR climb mode is engaged on the auto thrust channel. We're also going to flight level, so that's standard of 1013 set as it was the same as the QNH today. Right, we are underway finally. Let's run the checklist then so we are already through 10,000 feet but after takeoff checklist brake temperature 
check. So the break temperature we did find earlier that is down here. Um, but they are nice and low. Landing gear uh, up, so probably have to check it first. Speed brake lever retract, so let's get rid of that. Flaps that lever up and retracted it is. Engine ignition selector, we no longer need it, not in any turbulent condition, so I'm going to turn that to off. Center fuel pump, not required. We haven't got fuel in the center pumps, and we're on 1013. Next checklist is the descent. We're through 10,000 feet, so I'm going to turn off the seatbelt signs. I'm also going to turn off some of these lights and retract them so we don't get the rumble and the noise. Nose gears up, so let's turn those off. And you can see now we're in a very capable aeroplane. It's, it's starting to make a bit more sense as I spend more time in it. <laughs> this does take time and patience, this aircraft. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's not quite the same as some other things. Um, so I want to accelerate it now, and I'm imagining that would be a uh, control wheel steering sort of feature. But what I could do is I can engage vertical speeds, and I can lower the vertical speeds. So let's lower it to 1,200 feet per minute. We've still got climb EPR, which the auto throttle system is managing for us. I'll... Not sure why it's warning. Very easy to get warnings out of this airplane. It's, it's given me a lot so far. No doubt my mistakes uh, are causing that. By the way, there's our top of climb. It does have vertical navigation. So we can see the top of climb banana where it thinks we'll reach 29,000 feet. All very nice. And the, the little marker as well. So I'm going to let it accelerate to about three, maybe 300 knots. I'm not sure if he can climb that fast. And then I'm going to re-engage IS mode. There is, of course, the VNAV mode as well. But seeing as I'm not entirely sure... Well, let's try it out. That's what we're here for. So, oh, punching the microphone. Let's go to... We've got NAV mode engaged. VNAV. Okay, FMS EPR. Should be about the same. NAV, VNAV climb. It's going to level off at 290. And... I don't know what the speed, decimal 73, I assume it's going to aim for, something like that, when it can. Still accelerating with a gentle climb. The engagement of the automatics was quite unique. You need to really have all the right modes engaged. It's not like the Airbus where you can just put in an autopilot and then work it out. So that's something to be aware of in this airplane. Here we are now reaching our level off. Got just uh, 1,500 feet to go. Um, you can see down here we have vertical speed indicator with TKS to standby. So I don't know if the TKS would work, but we do know in Microsoft Flight Simulator that is possible now. So my hope would be that it does. But this does prove that I have not set this to TARA like it should be. Uh, you see you can get a range ring down here to control it with. And there we go, TARA. Uh, and it's got the range ring shown. So. That's something I should have done earlier, <laughs> constantly learning with this airplane and rem remembering little details. You can see VNAV is targeting about decimal 74 Mach number. There's the chime for a thousand feet to go. And that 290 has gone from amber and now it's gone to capture. So it's capturing 290. Very important and it's a very frustrating design choice, but um, the, a lot of aircraft do have this where if you put the altitude in the window, the aircraft will not level off unless you arm it. To arm it, you just simply left click the altitude dial. Not too difficult to do, but it's certainly a different function to that of the Airbus. So we're going to make sure it does level off uh, on here. Now I'm sure there's a reason it says VOR fail, um, maybe just because I have not tuned the correct frequency of one, but uh, we shall find out as the flight carries on. We are of course using our uh, flight management system anyway. So 100 feet to go. So talking about this altitude arming, there are lots of different vari variations in the configuration of this aircraft you can have. Um, by the way, these little dials here, just like the Airbus, we're controlling the brightness of these displays, quite like that, and the background lighting. So the configuration can include a, a few different things. It's done through this external software I've mentioned a few times. So what I'm going to do now is just bring that up on the screen for you guys to see. So here we have the window of the um, Mad Dog software. You can see that it's running a certain air rack. It tells you that it's connected to the simulator. And we have lots of different information and options. So we've got the installed version. 
the variant of course i only have the one at the moment and you can choose if you want to have the pilot avatars visible i've turned them off otherwise they're in the way whilst you're in the virtual cockpit uh, and then you've got the kilograms obviously which i wanted to use then we have the load manager for this one i said import ofp and again because i put those flight plans into the right area it took them straight from the sim brief flight plan very clever it read that itself loaded this up and we also did that in the simulator there is a route tab which i'm not using right now uh, where you could try and load in uh, your route but i've done that in the sim then we've got the aircraft it's the certain livery because if we go back to livery manager this is a separate application that opens up you can also install them i believe in the more traditional way otherwise you have to install them into this folder in your documents folder which i've had to find out through my discord so quite challenging to figure some of this stuff out but if you take the livery from flightsim.to my belief is that you can install it the normal way into your flight simulator community folder here we have the aircraft options and there are a lot. I'm not entirely sure what the tail style is talking about. I imagine it's a modification to some variants. We've also got the units. Of course, I've got kilograms, millibars and the PFD flight director style. Um, so FD is a crossbar for me. That's what I like. But you've obviously got the single Q, which would be the more traditional triangle style. I don't know if changing that whilst running is a good idea. So I might leave it as it is. <laughs> Uh, and then you've got the RMI type. And here we can have different variations. So I've gone for a, a reasonably high spec one, I like to think. So I've got the TAS, which is the true airspeed indicator. You can see that uh, that is tucked away over here. So TAS 437, static air temperature at minus 39. So that's over there. That obviously must have been an option to fit later. Uh, the gear warning inhibited above 1500, but I haven't got. Uh, you can have the PFD wide. I assume these are all realistic variations on how this aircraft was modified. For example, I mentioned auto arming the altitude. There it is. You can tick there. So I don't have it ticked, so I have to arm the altitude myself every time. Um, and then we have a few other things. Now, I'm not sure what ticking the EFB would do, so I haven't loaded that for this flight, but that's something I'll look at in the future. Uh, I'm not sure how you can get charts in. Also, we have the... Um, realistic mode available with failures if you wanted to have that and manual fuel loading and handling but i haven't bothered with that for this flight either but that is an option there and you can change if you want the autopilot to disconnect by leaning on the controls uh, and how you want the aircraft to be fueled up you can see enable pm calls we do have which is of course something i very much wanted i do like that uh, and a few other things synchronize the um, settings each side and i had to tick use pfbx or simbri for fuel route planning and acars ofp so i had to tick that before my installing it in that folder would work uh, and then we can set some specific uh, failures here so if we wanted to do that which I do not <laughs> you can have that but I've not got it enabled at the moment as you saw earlier on so that's what that little uh, application is doing in the background and that is running whilst you have the simulator running so quite powerful and quite uh, quite novel right so as I talk about that I want to show you a bit more um, by the way, we are in VNAV, so it has gone to stay in VNAV, and that means FNS speed is engaged for the auto thrust system, which is what I would want. So it's managing the throttles nicely to keep us at decimal seven three, which is a pretty good speed actually, quite a quite a reasonably quick aeroplane, uh, especially down at this flight level. I'm sure it probably runs at normal speeds if you go up higher. So going back into here, you can see we have the OFP I imported, which has all the usual information formatted the same way as it is. So there's our 8.3 tons of fuel and so on. So this is this is standard stuff as I use it for most of my flying. And you can actually cycle through it. It's categorized quite nicely. Wind information, the ATC flight plan, weather, no TAMs affecting us. I do like that. So that is neatly done. Uh, something else I want to show you is that it will load it into the FMS. If we go to the ACARS, I can go to um, menu, ACARS. And then uh, we've got received messages. And it's actually automatically sent us the flight plan so there we go and we can scroll through it in here including even the fuel you're expecting so that's pretty cool we've got uh, oh and there was a crew message there what does this tell us this is the weight as well so yeah it's it's neat and the more time i'm spending with it the more the more i'm realizing it it just doesn't set up as you would initially expect um, so there we go, we got the time we pushed back and the time we took off as well. The times are all going to be wrong because I've had to pause this sim as we've been going. But uh, yeah, so this is the sort of thing airlines will use via ACARS. They'll send this off back to base and then that's something they can use to help keep track of the airplanes and the, the tech logs and so on. The FMS working as you'd expect. We've got uh, this very Boeing style, so progress page. Uh, I'm going to arrive in um, Naples with 3.8 tonnes of fuel and 
that's at 1319z T clock is down there on the right oh there's one here 1345 oh that's not worked then i thought i rewound the time uh let me see what i've done there ah i don't know i've been messing around with the time so that's obviously not helped the situation but that was working earlier <laughs> until i messed around with the time when i in the process of recording this video um so that is uh all up and running as you would expect and the first officer's back <laughs> um good um we've already put our departure arrival in again very familiar to boeing pilots but it is, it is of note that it does have a fully functioning vnav so uh, descent point is going to be somewhere after Ibuli for erica and if we go through you can see it with a planned speed flight levels all the way through from bento and then that's simply the ILS there if we go back to the sorry if i go to the init ref page i'll also get the approach information so if we land flats 40 127 knots course 234 ILS 109.5 decimal five with the runway 2647 something i like about boeings i'm actually going to tune that in uh now so 109.5 decimal five and an inbound course of 234. Almost certainly not how you would do this in a real aircraft. You'd probably tune the VORs as you went by as a backup. Uh, and you've got two sides, of course. 195, 234. Quite like the digital display up here. Modeled quite nicely. Uh, also, I need to turn off this art. I have no idea what the art system is. It's something I'm going to look up uh, as we go. Let's just update that heading bug. And I would imagine up at these sorts of flight... Yeah, there we go. So it says localize and glides at fail because it's not receiving anything. I would imagine up here we would want to limit the bank angles. Let's go for... I think that's about 15 degrees there. Good. So we're cruising along now, making progress. Uh, I can show you a few other things. This is our way to see data on the waypoint. So now it gives us the times, 12.44. Uh, different waypoints, airports, and nav aids, so you can bring them up all on your screen down here. The weather radar is not functioning at the moment, as far as I'm aware. This is quite typical of Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft, due to the fact that the, the source simulator is not able to give that data to these uh, aircraft at the moment, I believe. So we shall see if that arrives in the in the future. But my understanding is that is uh, currently in opt. There you go. But the terrain does work. So little terrain button there, and there it is. Something we certainly should have looked at by now would be a fuel check. So uh, I mentioned earlier about resetting the fuel used with this button here. You actually currently get the fuel flow. So 138 or 1,300 um, and 1,400. But then if I press this button, it highlights used and we get the amount used per side. So we can see that they're actually, they've actually used about the same each side as well. Next, pressurization system. If we look on the overhead panel down here. We can see our pressurization is down here. So we've had our air supply on auto. Copy temperature is just set to auto in the middle. Uh, I don't see any reason to fiddle with that. I've got the air conditioning shut off override just to auto. Everything with auto, I like having an auto, as you know. Ram air is off. Ram air would just be fresh air from outside, typically used to clear smoke out of an airplane or if you've lost both of the packs just for ventilation in an unpressurized aircraft, things like that. So not normal to use have a ram air open on aircraft. Some aircraft may use it as part of procedure, I don't know if the MD-80 did. Here is our pressurization controller. So we have it set to the primary system. We've got to put the landing altitude in and we put the landing barrow in as well. So 1013 is set at the moment. So that's all good and it's being controlled by the primary system. And we can see on here the cabin climb rate is currently sitting at neutral. So that's working nicely. Again, you would have checked this in the climb checks or during the climb, certainly by 10,000 feet. Then up here we have the actual information I'm looking for, which is the cabin altitude of 5,000 feet. And you've got the inner side showing you the differential pressure limit of about 8.4. Very common sort of pressurization limit on short haul aircraft. Currently sitting about 7.5 at 5,000 feet. So you could actually, we could actually have the cabin altitude a little bit lower should we want to. But to control that ourselves, we'd have had to, um, if I go down here, we can see, here we go. So this is the valve. Remember on the ground, it was down here. This yellow dial was down here at open. And now it's all the way up towards the, the closed position. Then we have this system set to auto here uh, for the cabin pressurization. Very strange. Never seen this before, but that's how they got it on this aircraft. 
so a good bit of fun. Still got the pneumatic cross speeds open, but I should certainly turn off the auto brake and it's all automatically disarmed anyway. Uh, but then we can set it up for our landing. Here you've got to stabilize the trim. I assume that's the cutoff switch. Then we've got our usual VHF radios, three of those here, so quite well equipped, and what looks like the NDB or ADF tuner. I'm going to turn on some panel lights here. It looks like there's a little inner dial as well. What I'm going to do is just set it to night time so we can take a look at the aircraft in the, the, the low light. So still in the same place, but we've accelerated time, and now you get a sense of the aircraft's lighting. Really very lovely. I haven't managed to get this map light to work. Uh, I think I've tried all the right things, but I can't get, can't get it to turn on. Um, maybe it's not fitted on this aircraft, but we have got the uh, panel lights working, which is good news and lots and lots and lots of lights all hidden all over the place. So here's the blood lights, lots of different scales on those that you can adjust and the brightness does seem to vary. Panel lighting to go behind it, which we're going to keep up, of course, and the digital lights. So, yeah, I think it's a, a very nicely lit cockpit. Seems very realistic and you've got um, floodlights down here for the main panel and so on there you go flooding the center pedestal maybe you're trying to have your lunch or do some paperwork might be nicer to have those open oh sorry on Whilst we're adjusting lights, let's put on, not the wing landing lights, but let's put on some of the, uh, where was it, wing nacelle lights. Let's see if turning those on and the ground flood lights on. I just wonder, what do those do? There we go. So we have little lights here to look at the nacelle, and then we have lights here looking back at the wing, and I guess this is the ground flood light. So why would you have all, all of these lights? Well, um, the nacelle lights will be used to see if there's ice on the intakes. I would imagine that would be used rarely because of course you can't see those from the flight deck but maybe in certain emergency situations it may be required for someone to go and check i don't know um maybe on the ground or something like that but there they are that's not unusual to have lights that can't be used properly because the airbus 321 has wing lights wing inspection lights you can't you see the wing from the flight deck anyway but perhaps in a certain situation you might want to walk back and see them it's a good idea to have it so that the pilots can if they need to go and see the wings so that's why we've also got these wing inspection lights, which uh, floodlight the wing. Beautifully modeled, really, really very nice. It's, uh, it's looking great. I'm not sure quite what the contrails are doing there. It seems to be just the effect I've got of this time of day. And then you've got those ground floodlights. So beautifully lit model, no doubt about it. Very, very impressed. And the, uh, the aircraft is really, really growing on me the more time I spend with it making this video, <laughs> which is taking quite a, quite a while at the moment as I've had to learn so much about it. Uh, and I'm still way, way, way behind where I want to be. But there you go. Something else I should have done, cruise for the EPR limit. Not that it was using it anyway, because of course it's in its own mode, uh, in the FMS following mode anyway, but there we are. So let's have a look. Can we see our top of descent yet? If I wind the range out and I get rid of some of the clutter. Yes, <laughs> it was hidden in there. About 80 miles to go until we begin our descent into Naples. So what we're going to do is bring back the time just to make it a bit more pleasant for you guys to look at, although certainly going to have confused the aircraft and the simulator by now. We're going to come down to the FMS, we'll go to the legs page, and I'm going to bring up the charts. And what we'll do is, is there a good way I can show you that? Let me try and find a different view. Let's do it like that. So here's our arrival, the IPCAM to Zulu is what we expected. So it ends up at IPCAM, 7,500 feet. There is a note too that we could be lower by ATC. We're not going to have ATC for this, so we will not do that. And let's go to, if I go to step, I believe. Legs. Oh, I'm not sure how to do step. Ah, I think I need to go to plan mode. So let's do that. Let's put it to plan. Now we see step. So I can also see it on my navigation display over here. So we'll zoom in the range. So you can see, you can do a lot of things as you would expect. So there's legs, page one from Gengi, which is where we were. Um, and then we've got Evuli, and we'll step through. But effectively ending up at IPCAM. 
Hi Dipcam, I want to be, yeah, flight level 95 seems reasonable. Certainly that's above the restriction, 240 knots. So that is a reasonable speed to be at this point as well. Then we are going to move in around this arc from RN411 to Bento. So RN411, Bento, and there is the arc in there to CF24. 230 knots at Bento, this has 240. So I'm not convinced that's good enough. So what I'm gonna do is put in, uh, let's see if I can just type in 230 as a restriction at Bento. Nope, that did not work. Arrays. <laughs> Is it 230k that works if you do that? Nope, definitely not. I am woefully underprepared. Anyway, you can see that you can adjust the restrictions in there if you want to. We'll just manage at 250 knots. <laughs> Around we go. Uh, and then we'll fly the ILS. This has us at CF24 at 5,900 feet. We bring up the ILS chart, lots of terrain around, so we don't want to be low. Bento, it says here, is 7,000 feet, which is what we'll be at 7,000. And 5,900 feet is the platform altitude from CF. Uh, so that is looking pretty good. 5,900 feet at 16 miles out. And then we'll head in, descending with the ILS by this point. Final fix 24 at 3,770, which will be the 10 mile point FF24 written there. So that's all looking good. We've got the ILS tuned. It's got the speed in there. We are going to obviously take a note of the speed we plan to descend at. So let's run a landing performance then. As we check the routes, we can go back to the performance tab. And this time we we'll go to landing. We're not landing in Milan. We're landing in Naples. Very responsive this. I do like it. Landing in runway 24. Condition dry. Calm winds 1013. And we'll go for... Now, 15.40, I assume 15 is for the slats, <laughs> uh, 40 for the flaps. But we're going to go for full flap, I think, today. Not sure how common that would be. Lots of different combinations. So 15.40, and we need a landing weight. So let's go to our init ref. Gross weight at the moment, 55.6. We're going to burn, uh, let's see, current fuel, 4.5. We're going to burn about another one and a half tons. So 55, so we've got 54 tons on landing. Calculate. So we need 1,200 meters with the factor. So the actual landing distance, 1,000 meters. So this is very short, actually, at that, that flap. Uh, that's going to be more than enough because, of course, landing on that runway. Uh, let's have a look at the airport of Naples. And it is a 2,600 meter runway, but it is an inset threshold. So the landing distance on 2.4 is actually 2,400 meters. So that does tempt me actually to, let's do a flap, see if we can do flap 15 and 28. Now, how we set that is going to be a whole other mission. 28 to 28, 40, 40. <laughs> flap takeoff selector here. Mm, this continues to be a real mission for me to work out. I'm sure there'll be some helpful comments uh, informing me what I've been doing wrong on there. <laughs> so, that all works. Loads of room. Auto brake. Let's put it to uh, medium. And calculate again. There you go. That ups the distance. So, manual braking in performance calculators in real aircraft is the highest braking normally, auto brake being lower. So, if we go for brakes of medium and arm, I won't arm it yet. But uh, yeah, that's actually quite a big difference. So let's go for our original plan. 15 and 40, medium auto brake, 1900 factored, which is probably a sensible thing to do. So here we have our speeds. So we've got a uh, V, so velocity with, I'm assuming this is flaps up and slats retracted, a minimum clean speed of 222. We have to start putting uh, slats out to get to 174. Flaps out to go to 151, and then finally um, full at 128. If we go around, we'll go around to 145 knots. So there's the speed and the profile. Finalize that plan for everybody. That means we're going to uh, configure. We can pretty much configure after the 16 mile points, but we do have a bit of height to lose here. Only two miles, we need to lose a thousand feet. So that's quite a steep drop. Um, and then, but then we have four miles to lose a bit more. So actually. We've got six miles to get from about 6,000 feet to 4,000 feet, which is about three degrees. So I want to have a bit of flap out before I start past the 16 mile point on the RS. 
Minima, I'm going to put in a uh, minima of, let's go for the 540. Now, I think that's just going to, all we can do for that is put it in here. I have not figured out the better way, <laughs> so we shall see. We are now arriving at our top of descent. MCDU message flashing on the PFD. So, of course, what do we see? Reset FGCP altitude, flight guidance control panel altitude. So I'm going to clear that. This being a uh, effectively a Boeing style uh, flight deck, I'm going to put in, as always, my traditional 10,000 flight 100 starting point. And I suspect, as we've left it in VNAV for the flight, it's going to just head down as we pass over the top of descent. I'm going to look at a few different automatic modes during the descent um, to try and highlight some differences that I've seen uh, about it and something I've learned since doing this video. By the way, of course, um, I know I haven't mentioned it yet, but the obvious reason this it behaves like a Boeing is because it is basically a Boeing. This was manufactured by McDonnell Douglas and Boeing commercial aircraft. Okay, here's our top of descent marker then. If I look on the progress page, it should tell us... Uh, top of descent, three nautical miles to go, two nautical miles to go. I think this is all going to be very straightforward. Excellent. So let's see what happens. You can see the vertical speed indicator up here. It seems to show you the current vertical speed, quite unusual. But there you go, we are now descending. The throttles are idling or goes to it, I hope. Back they come. Now, I'm using VNAV, which is going to keep us on this nav path. But let's imagine air traffic control asks us for something specific or I want to control it a bit more manually. Obviously, we have vertical speed, and quite a clever feature here is that because this is constantly running the, the vertical speed in use, it's actually, I can just press vertical speed, and it should just stop and do 2,600. So there's vertical speed, 2,600 feet per minute. That's great, very straightforward. And then we can adjust that using the thumb wheel. Now, I mentioned earlier that I used IS mode in the climb. So if I put IS mode in the window, uh, and I got, there you go, uh, climb on the old thrust, um, but yeah, we are now using or mac it's actually mac mode because we're so high up but i mentioned earlier that i put it into vertical speed let the aircraft accelerate to change that the target speed because now it's targeting a speed and it will pitch accordingly so if i was to add power it would pitch up or whatever so well it's confusing itself now um there we go put them back to idle <laughs> right so now you can see that it's raising the nose to try and keep the speed to change that speed, I don't need to put it into vertical speed and put it back. I can actually just adjust it on here. So here I can adjust the Mach number, and if it was in uh, speed mode, I could do it on there. But let's put it back to VNAV, which is the most simple. FMS, EPR, VNAV, descent. That is all as you would expect. And now it should regain this profile over here. I really like this old school side slip indicator. Ooh, why is it flashing? It's old school slide slip indicator, very basic, <laughs> not quite as advanced as one of the Airbus, but nonetheless practical. Okay, we just had a drag required. There we go, drag required message there, flashing MCDU message on the PFD. So we're going to use the speed brakes. Let's go for half, and throttles are definitely at idle. Let's see if I can get the good view to show you. There we go, and we'll put them out a bit more. Not sure how powerful they were on this aircraft, but there they are. Seems to be putting us back in the range of where we want to be. Beautiful day for this approach. Helps by the fact that I've set beautiful weather. On the overhead panel now, we can see the cabin is descending, which is what we would expect to see. I've set 200 feet into the landing altitude. Oh, no, that's not right. There we go. So that's in hundreds of feet, so that should be 200 feet there is my understanding as opposed to 2,000. Uh, I am also going to just have a look at these messages. And you can see, I like this. It's sort of a hybrid of the caution warning panel you used to get and a nice uh, contained ECAM, as it were. Although obviously not about to show you any actual procedures. But all looking good. We haven't had to use any of the anti ice systems. Not sure what tail does, I must confess. Again, so much to learn about this aeroplane. I've also been looking around hopelessly for the fuel temperature. I'm sure it's very obvious and I've embarrassed myself just by saying that. But uh, if the fuel temperature does get too low, we do actually have fuel heaters on this aircraft. It's quite unusual, but there they are. A lot of aircraft these days will 
heat the fuel by exchanging the heat from the oil into the fuel. It cools the oil and it heats the fuel. I believe this aircraft does the same thing. You can see here oil temperature 8794. So what I'm going to do is turn on the fuel heaters. Apparently not. Why not? Got a warning over here. Oh yeah, fuel heaters on. So I'm expecting to see the oil temperature now drop and it's doing exactly the opposite. <laughs> um, I don't know. It could be a quirk of the system, it could be the way it's designed, it could be something that happens initially, but I'm going to turn that off before it gets too hot. I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> hmm. We shall leave that alone and let's hope that those temperatures don't continue to rise indefinitely. So I'm going to carry on with the descent by putting in an altitude of 7,000 feet in the window. I would set Q&H of course. 1013 is already set. Uh, sorry, actually 7,500 feet. Now this does lead me to an interesting issue, which is I don't know how to set uh, 500 increments, but I am going to allow the autopilot to bank up to 30 degrees now. So there we are, passing through 10,000 feet. It's deceleration to 240 knots, which is what we expected it to do according to the routing in the FMS. I'm also going to put on the wing lights. So 7,000 feet is safe. After IPCAM to RN411. So we're now on this leg here. There we are. We're on the vertical profile if a tiny bit high. So that's working out well. There's through 10,000 feet. Let's turn on the fasten seatbelt signs as well. Time for the camera crew to get ready. You can get messages from the camera crew. I haven't heard them all. But I have heard PAs made. So they were making PAs on the ground as I was starting out the aircraft and again in flight. So that's quite a nice feature. Of course, I need to arm the altitude. So there's 7,000 armed. It's decelerated. I'm hoping it will continue its descent. It's gone into VNAV level. Let's try pre VNAV des. There we go. So we've definitely got ourselves a bit high now. That's slightly concerning. So I'm going to use the C. Hmm, let's see. Let's see how you'd fix this in a Boeing. I can see the localizer maybe is starting to appear. After this leg, we can descend down to... Uh, still 7,500, but 7,000 by ATC. So we're going to use that 7,000 by ATC until I work out how to do increments. Uh, and then we're going to go down to um, 5,949. So I'm going to help it out with a bit of speed break. It's quite an effective speed break. It does seem to work well. And now, next point is Bento, 7,000 feet. After that, we can descend down. Motion. I'm actually going to override the computer now. I want to fly a slower speed. I want to come back to my minimum clean about 230 knots, only a little bit slower, but let's press speed and then we get speed mode and alt hold at 7000, which is where we want it to be. I want it to slow down slightly. Now we're going to start putting some flaps out. So let's bring the slats out and the first stage of flaps. Slats extended. Stabilizer See the glide slope is about where we are. Hopefully once it makes this turn, the localizer will start to come in. Now we can slow down the speed again because we've got some flaps out. So I think we can go back to at least 180. According to our speeds, there we go. Right, let's put in a lower altitude. We said an altitude of 5.9, so let's put in 6 initially. I'll do it in vertical speeds. We've got vertical speeds. I'm also going to arm the localizer. So lock in amber. There we go. Lock capture. It's already captured the localizer. And we're going to need to descend faster than 3 degrees because we're already at that. So let's put in 1500 or 1600 and use the speed brakes to help it slow down. I'm actually going to insert the glide slope from this point onwards. Making sure that we pass those altitudes accordingly. So if I press RLS, you'll see RLS armed. It's already on the localizer. As we descend from above at 600 feet per minute, 
below 200 knots that's more than three degrees so we should meet that glide slope from above so what flat setting have we got that is the most confusing part 11 so looks good the pitch angle looks good hopefully we'll meet that oh very effective speed brakes so much so they're actually causing the engines to spool up so hopefully any second now it will inset the glide slope it's complaining so let's wind that back to 160 let's go for another bit of flat 15 it's complaining about the altitude because we've now gone through it because we've armed the ILS but that is no problem because that's what I'm trying to achieve we are pretty much on the glide slope just trying to convince it to capture that so just over 10 miles out 4,000 feet about right for 12 miles out speed of 180 knots there's the radio altimeter coming to life we've got terrain beneath us so that is of course flashing up and down I'm going to put the going altitude in the window of that's up here on these charts 6,000 feet so I'll leave that at 6 just hoping to see ILS arm oh no there we go it is armed lock and glide slope so been waiting for that time it's been doing a great job of flying the glide slope should have probably seen the fact it wasn't flying my uh, vertical speed I asked for okay so this is now working out I'm going to bring the speed brakes in then hopefully the throttle is going to stay somewhere close to idle we're going to do a speed of 160 knots which is quite normal pitch angle looks good flying about 900 feet per minute which makes sense a little surprise we haven't got a DME showing up here uh, but I think that's the DME there or certainly that's to the next point um, in front of us so 8 miles to go to touchdown looking pretty reasonable time to configure so let's lower landing gear I'm going to come back to 128. I'm going to add 5, so I'm going to do 133 on final. There's the runway in front of us now. And I think if we click here, it should target those speeds. So there you go, 128. And then it's put a little amber bug about where we want it. And now let's go to the last stages of flap. Check that they're traveling there. What I've totally forgotten to do is give us all the checklists. There was the descent and approach checklist. <laughs> so we're going to say we've done all of that. Uh, we've left the hydraulics on the whole time, so that's my mistake. That's all done. Landing it down. Flaps that. Speed brake, we need to arm. Auto brake, we're going to arm. Engine condition to both. And that's it. So no surprise, this is going to go to both just like it did for takeoff. The hydraulics are set for full redundancy on an auto. And we're going to arm the auto brake. Now the gear is down at medium. Great. So. I'm going to set the thrust levers to something reasonable for ready for when I take over. There's the outer marker in blue. We can see the landing gear three greens are there. I'm going to put go around mode as the limit on the engines to give them that if they need it. And you can see go around mode is armed on here. Not convinced about the speed. It's nose is a little bit higher than I'd like. So I'm just going to put 137. Just going to increase it a little bit. It is a little bit choppy as well. Auto thrust system doing a very nice job though. Very happy with that. So it's time, we have the fast slow bug here by the way, so instead of a speed tape it just shows us whether we're a little bit fast or slow. Let's turn off the order throttles, we have 1.11 on the EPR. So let's put that back there. I know it's off, that's what I've done on purpose. And we'll turn off the autopilot and let's give it a go, making no promises here. So getting fast, bringing the power back, way too fast now. <laughs> Amazing how quickly it runs away. Sink rate's too high there, so just bring it back in. Quite a heavy aeroplane on the tail, on the pitch. Two 
on speed. Idle. Let it settle. You can hear the speed brakes. I would deploy reverse if I had that functioning, but I've totally failed to bind the reverses. But of course, this airplane does have reverse. I'm hoping the auto brake is engaged. I'm not sure where that message would come up. It certainly feels like it's decelerating more than just from idle thrust, though. So, uh, yeah, auto brake's engaged. Let's go to manual brakes. And this would be obviously forward idle. And that's it. Welcome to Naples. Let's take this exit here. No point hanging around on the runway for much longer than that. Wow, what a machine. It is a really, really interesting aircraft to fly. And it's uh, it's been a real, real treat actually getting to learn it. My impression of this aircraft has changed a lot since I first first sat down with it. I was trying to figure out where things went and how to work out the documents and the sort of the getting sim brief imported. But now I've done the sector, I'm, I'm glad I took the time because it's it's quite uh, quite impressive. There's a lot of stuff going on here, and certainly I can tell there's a lot more to learn than I uh, I'm aware of at the moment. Some of the bindings of the controls continue to be an issue, such as how to get reverse. It's not quite as simple as as some other add-ons, but there we go. Right, let's vacate the runway. So that's it for today's video. I hope it's been interesting to you. As I said, I have no experience of the DC-9 or the MD-80 series of aircraft at all. Uh, I'm going to see if I can find out any more information about them before we go into any more future videos and streams. But hopefully I've been able to give you a bit of extra context around some of the differences compared to more modern aircraft such as the A320. And of course, the, uh, the systems that I do recognize from uh, other aircraft that we've flown on the channel. This add-on, as I said, is available on Sim Market from Leonardo. It is a really uh, detailed, high fidelity add-on. Again, I don't use that phrase study level. I don't. I don't necessarily know if, if any uh, any of these are, but this is a, a really, really up there in terms of the, the detail and the system steps they've gone to. It's very clear that the designers have a passion for this aircraft, which is always something I like to see. It, it makes an add-on uh, much more enjoyable when you know that the person who made it has, or the, the team that made it, have a, a real real interest in the airplane they've designed. And it's quite clear that this has been recreated as, as uh, very, very passionately. It is obviously very highly priced. It's, a, it's an expensive add-on, there's no doubt about it. So you will need to accept that if you do purchase this aircraft, it will take a bit of learning and you don't want to rush into this uh, and just hope that you can just load it up because as I discovered, I did purchase this myself, by the way, this has not uh, been sent over. This is, this is all honest opinions. Um, yeah, this aircraft is something that takes a bit of a learning curve. Some things, just little things like the livery manager, where the flight plans go and so on is not exactly the as simple as uh, some others uh, there's also features that aren't available in other aircraft so there you go it's uh, it's at, as it would expect to be for a complex add-on really they all come up with their own solutions to these things and uh, some of these are a little bit a little bit difficult to understand when you're coming in fresh same for the control assignments and figuring out where controls are I was disappointed to see that the inbuilt checklist don't show you where the instrument or the control you're looking for is so you you can't actually use that which is a very handy feature for aircraft that are brand new to us but this is a very unique aircraft it's a highly detailed add-on i like it a lot and i've got to say as i've spent time with it i've learned a lot more about it i still know barely anything but it's uh, certainly grown on me so that is something to consider and i'll be sure that i'll be streaming this on the channel in future i think this is a, a another level in the um game of raising the bar of flight simulator so we have this and of course we have the just like 146 and we've got many more highly detailed airliners coming out so this is uh yeah this is definitely 
definitely up there at the top of the the airliner level along with the the 146 for what we have available at the moment in microsoft flight simulator it is uh, i think very excellent but do consider the investment uh, if you're actually going to take uh, or have the time to learn it and get through the frustration of those first few uh, first couple of hours trying to get the aircraft turned on I'll be, as I said, streaming this as well as plenty more Airbus videos and guides. There's lots of live streams as well to come in different aircraft. So do please subscribe if you'd like to see more of that. Otherwise, we'll see you again in another video or live stream soon. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.